Hello, I'm Sarah Coldrick and I'm the legal consultant for AFCA Cymru. AFCA is a charity which works across the permanency sector in Wales, promoting good practice. We work closely with the National Adoption Service for Wales, with Welsh Government and other relevant organisations, including Cafcas Cymru. I hope you enjoy this presentation. This presentation, which will last for approximately 40 minutes, is for children's guardians and aims to provide a picture of how adoption in Wales is modernising and looks at the implications that has for you in representing the child's best interests across their lifetime in court. So what are we covering in today's webinar? The fact that adoption has changed and is continuing to change that it's the right permanence option for some children, a small number of children in Wales, but nevertheless the right permanence plan for those children. There are lifelong implications for all of those involved in the adoption process. In terms of the webinar, generally we're looking at what's right for the child across their lifetime. Kafkas Cymru's involvement in permanency planning for children the nuts and bolts of adoption work through care proceedings, how the local authority evidences the need for adoption in terms of the Adoption and Children Act and also the European Convention on Human Rights, and then lastly, using the NAS Good Practice Guides that you've just seen in the previous slide. This is a slide that we use in a lot of our presentations to demonstrate how adoption has changed and continues to change. Adoption used to be finding children for people who could not have their own children. And of course, over the years, the concept of adoption, as well as its practice, has changed enormously. It's now about finding families for children who need a permanent alternative family for life. There used to be a complete severance of any form of contact with the family of origin and very little information provided to the adopted person. And of course, that's changed over the years, over the last 30 years or so. Uh, but it continues to change in terms of openness. And it now acknowledges the need for information in terms of life journey material about the family of origin and the reasons for the child not being able to remain with them and provides information for an adoptive family to be able to share with their children uh, over the years for them to be able to understand their identity and be able to incorporate it into their adoptive family life. It also promotes keeping in touch with family members if that's in the child's best interests and that can be with parents, with brothers and sisters and other important family members including grandparents and that's a real move forward in terms of openness um, in adoptive families and we'll talk about that a little bit further on. Adoptive parents are now prepared and assessed in order that they can provide the kind of parenting that a child who has suffered developmental trauma needs. The five adoption regions in Wales and the voluntary adoption agencies have all developed adoption support services to help families with the complex task of creating or completing a family through adoption. And particularly if there is this keeping in touch, if there is contact, um, then that means that the, the adoption regions and to a lesser extent the, the VAAs are needing to provide those services to support that keeping in touch. And that really is seen as an invest to save. Adoption policy and practice continues to evolve and improve, helping everyone in the adoption triangle. And we're certainly not there yet. We continue to strive to promote uh, good practice uh, at, at a time when it really is very challenging uh, on the ground within local authorities. As a children's guardian, you'll be very familiar with this process. And I'm just going to go through it very quickly in terms of thinking about the process for adoption, where within the multi-track planning process, the local authority will be looking towards reunification with parents as a possibility, the possibility of kinship arrangements, be they under child arrangements orders, as a local authority foster carer or under the terms of a special guardianship order, 
They'll also be looking at adoption if that is the only option available that will meet the child's long-term needs. And then, of course, long-term fostering or residential care for a number of children where adoption is not possible. Just to say that, that we've mentioned Welsh early permanence there, and I'll come back to that. No doubt you have heard about this and maybe are beginning to see wet placements coming through within care proceedings. What is Welsh Early Permanence? It's the placement of a child, usually at the start of a set of care proceedings, with approved prospective adoptive parents who are also approved as foster carers. If you've practised in England, you will be aware of Foster to Adopt, but that is not the same and we don't have the facility for Foster to Adopt in Wales. We have to have full dual approval as both prospective adopter and foster carer. You will know that if children are to be removed from their parents, or indeed relinquished, and we'll talk about relinquished children in a short while, that the fewer moves that they have during the whole process of care proceedings, the better for the child. And therefore, Welsh Early Permanence, whatever the outcome at the end of a set of proceedings for the child, be that reunification, be that placement with extended family members, means that the child has had as few moves as possible. And if the child is subsequently made the subject of a placement order at the end of a set of care proceedings, then they can remain with those carers who then transform into being adoptive parents. WEP is not just for babies. We're seeing at the moment, as the Welsh Early Permanence develops throughout Wales, uh, that most of the children coming through into these placements uh, tend to be babies. But we're looking towards using Welsh Early Permanence in as many situations as possible where it's going to be in their best interests. So that can be children who are subject to an interim care order at a very early stage and that has been identified pre-birth in some cases or very shortly after birth. But we're also looking to using Welsh Early Permanence where there may have been a parent and child residential assessment or a foster placement, or even a Reg 26 placement, that is a, a, an emergency or short-term placement with a kinship carer, where sadly that placement has either disrupted or has been negative in its outcome if it's been an assessment. So that means where children would otherwise have gone on to another short-term um, but foster placement, before moving on to their long-term placement, they can move into a Welsh Early Permanence placement. It could also be used with children who are placed um, on a care order following care proceedings, a full care order, um, uh, either with kinship carers or where they've been placed with parents under a care order. Now, we know that the number of children placed um, under a care order with, with parents is now really reducing following recent case law. But where the contingency plan uh, following a set of uh, care proceedings is for adoption, should the placement with kinship carers disrupt, then that is uh, an ideal situation for a child to be able to go into a Welsh Early Permanence placement with, of course, a lot of support. So we're looking towards extending Welsh Early Permanence to toddlers and school-aged children and also to siblings, to brothers and sisters who need to stay together. You will see the WEP framework, which is available on the NAS website, um, and it's the one with the scales of justice with the, with the two children. The WEP framework is designed to be available for children where there is a high possibility of adoption. So how does a local authority identify children where there might be a high possibility of adoption at the end of a set of care proceedings? Usually it will be because there's previous involvement with the family, where wider family members have already been explored in previous care proceedings where there's no or, or very limited evidence of change, where there's no or very limited evidence of any realistic options within the network, where paternity is known, where the father is known, 
Um, and so all the other relatives within the paternal family are known. And if they're not known, clear steps have been taken to identify the father. What we need to do within the WET framework is differentiate between uncertainty and risk. And what we try to do is be clear about our language, particularly when talking to and involving WET foster carers, is that a possible return to a parent or to family members is an uncertainty. It's not a risk because if the court decides that that is the right way forward for the child, for the right plan for the child, then of course that is not a risk. That is the right thing for the child. The other uncertainty that we talk about within the Welsh Early Permanence Framework is the unknowns in a child's development that wet carers who may, in the fullness of time, become adoptive parents accept because their the child's developmental tra trajectory, particularly if they take on a very, t a very small baby, will not be known. And it's an acceptance of the possibility of that child having sustained some damage as, as well as developmental delay. When we talk about risk, we're talking about with a very few number of families, a level of dangerousness or violence within the birth family that may preclude the possibility of a wet placement for that child because there is a level of contact, a level of keeping in touch inevitable within a wet framework that might not be in the child's best interests and might not be right for a, a wet placement. There are very few children who are relinquished within Wales and the fantastic research that's been done by Kate Thomas, who you will know as your, your colleague, um, really shows that on average there are five relinquished babies um, over the period of a year, so one per region. They're very few and far between. Uh, they are very complex a lot of the time, uh, as, as you know, because you get involved with children who are relinquished. And this is just a note, really, to, um, to, to point you to the fact that you do have um, the joint guidance from the National Adoption Service, from CAFCAS Cymru and from ADSS Cymru. And that's really about uh, the whole process of of understanding and being sure that there really is consent to the child being uh, adopted. And WEP might seem to be the best type of placement for a child who is relinquished. But as we know, they are incredibly complex placements and there is a high level of uncertainty in terms of what will happen to that child. And therefore we do urge caution with the local authority in deciding upon a wet placement when it looks as though the child is going to be relinquished. These next couple of slides are really developing and providing some more information on what we've just talked about in terms of when a wet placement might be possible. So I'm not going to go through them in any detail. They're there for your own reference when it's useful for you. So that first possible placement, one is where the child is placed very early on in the placement. Possible WEP placement two is where a residential placement or a foster placement is negative in outcome or is ended in uh, some way. Possible WEP placement three is where the child is in a mainstream foster placement and that placement has to end for some reason. And we, as we know, that can sometimes happen within mainstream foster care where there's illness or, or, or something happens within the family. And again, that's about the child being able to move to a wet placement. Even if they then go back to family members, they won't have had any more moves than they would have done had they gone to a mainstream foster placement. And if the child then does go on to adoption as a, a plan, then they've been able to avoid that one placement and they've been with those wet carers from that early time. Wet placement four is uh, uh, about children being placed post full care order being made. And, and as I said before, those are unlikely and will be few and far between, but it's still useful to think about them. Just to say a bit about the role of the local authority in permanency planning where adoption may be an option. And commencing care proceedings uh, and the case management hearing. 
So the local authority will probably identify adoption as a possible care plan in its evidence filed at the start of proceedings where it's stating how it's going to multi-track plan for that particular family. And by the case management hearing, which has to happen by day 12, the local authority will need to be able to timetable for, firstly, the filing of the CARB report, and we'll talk about the CARB later on, the child's adoption medical, which is undertaken by the adoption agency's medical advisor, who is a community paediatrician. And then lastly, the agency decision makers, usually the head of services decision as to whether the child should be adopted under the Adoption Agencies Wales Regulations 2005. And they have to do all of that so that the local authority is ready to make an application for a placement order um, in time for the issues resolutions hearing. And of course, that all has to be filed way before week 20 in order for the parents to be able to file their evidence and you to be able to file your final analysis. We would ask you to be mindful of the need for time for the agency decision maker to have the proper evidence in front of them in order to be able to make the decision that the child should be adopted, which of course is the precursor to the application for the placement order. Just a bit of a refresher about what the CARB report is. For the purposes of pursuing a care plan for adoption, it's, it has two functions because under the adoption agency's regulations, the court may not make a placement order unless the agency decision maker, and that is, as I, as I said before, usually the head of children's services, makes the decision that the child should be placed for adoption. And the ADM makes this decision based on the information contained in the child's adoption report. So that's the CAR element. But also this document has a, a second function because when the local authority applies for a placement order, it has to file an Annex B report under the family procedure rules. And a placement order obviously provides the adoption agency, the local authority, with the authority to place the child with prospective adoptive parents. And the CARB B report was compiled to be able to help the local authority, the adoption agency, provide both those types of evidence within the one document. This is what makes the CARB report so difficult. It has so many different functions. First of all, as I say, it's for the ADM to make the decision as to whether the child should be adopted. The second is for the court to decide whether or not to make a placement order. It's then used by the adoption agency for the purposes of linking and matching with prospective adoptive parents and prospective adoptive parents have sight of the car B before they decide that they want to be matched with those particular children or, or child. And then that car B becomes the information that the adoptive parents have in terms of curating that child's history, providing that information to the child as they grow up. And of course, they have their life journey book and they have their later life letter. But they also have that car B information, which parents, adoptive parents, need to be able to layer up over the years in order to be able, at the 18th birthday, say to their adoptive child or children, you know everything now that we know. And if we want to go and find anything else out, we'll go to the adoption agency together. Of course, we know that sadly that doesn't happen all the time. We're working towards that happening. The adopted adult who hasn't had that uh, access to the car B has the right to see that once they are 18 under the Access to Information Post-Commencement Regulations 2005. And so it's critical that this car B is written not only in terms of providing evidence to the agency decision maker and to the court for the need for ad an adoption order, but it also has to be written in such a way that a, a, a young person can look at it and understand why it is that they needed to be adopted. And that's what makes it such a difficult report to, to write. And it takes time to get that right. It's now 10 years since we had the case of both REB and REBS, which introduced the terms nothing else will do and last resort in relation to local authorities' plans for adoption. And practitioners and, and lawyers in the courts all interpreted this as a change in the law 
and a move away from adoption as a valid option for some children. And this really affected care planning and saw the number of children made subject to placement orders reduce significantly. However, really subsequent judgments and speeches, particularly since 2014 by the senior judiciary, have sought to clarify what REB and REBS really meant. And I think what's useful is the speech that was made by Sir Andrew McFarlane, the president of the family division in 2016. And he looked, first of all, at the welfare test. And we need to remember, of course, that where adoption proceedings are taking place, we look at the Adoption and Children Act welfare checklist, the amended checklist. And of course, the test for determining whether a child should move into adoption turns on their welfare throughout their life. And this is where the courts are expected to take into account the lifelong implications of the child becoming a member of another family for their life and ceasing to be a member of, a legal member of their birth family for their life. And obviously that's the paramount consideration for the court and for the adoption agency. So the evidence in care proceedings and in the CAR B in order to obtain the placement order, undertaking that balancing exercise in terms of each permanency option, each realistic option with its benefits and challenges, and looking at the lifetime of the child provides the information to prove that we prefer the term only adoption will do rather than nothing else will do, that only adoption is going to meet that child's lifelong needs. And I think we really need local authorities and Guardians and the courts need to be thinking about the child throughout their life, not just now, but in 5, 10, 20 years' time, because we are looking at their lifetime. These decisions require their welfare to be considered throughout their life. The President then went on to look at the European Convention on Human Rights and how that affects child care law and he first of all looked at the doctrine of necessity and the out said that the outcome for the child as well as doing that which meets their welfare requirements under section one of the adoption and children act must also be necessary for their own protection and must be proportionate and of course we know that the doctrine of proportionality requires a reasonable relationship between the desired outcome and the means of achieving that outcome. And of course, proving that only adoption will do is indeed that. It's providing a proportionate response to that particular child's needs. The President says, is adoption required? That is, the local authority can prove that only adoption will do. Proportionality is built into the Children Act and the Adoption and Children Act. And he he reminds us that Under the section one principles, a court shall not make the order or any orders unless it considers that doing so would be better for the child than making no order at all. So that doctrine of proportionality is built into both the Children Act and the Adoption and Children Act. And and therefore, if we meet those welfare requirements, particularly in relation to looking at the child's life throughout their lifetime, the child's welfare throughout their lifetime then we're meeting those necessity and proportionality doctrines. So thinking about the child's welfare throughout their life really is the basis upon which these four good practice guides have been formulated. The first one on the left-hand side is the contact, keeping in touch, and we'll make reference to that a little bit later on, but it's based on the current and changing needs of the child and who is important to them. And it's, as I say, taking into account the fact that a child needs to understand uh, where they've come from, that identity, and, and that lifelong need for knowing where they've come from. The second uh, guide, the, the pink one, is about transitions and early support, and really looks at that critical time of moving children into an adoptive placement from their foster placement. But of course, it can be used in terms of good practice to all sorts of other permanence planning for children going from one 
foster placement to another or being reunified moving on to a kinship placement that that good practice still uh, applies the green one is uh, about working with birth families so that's about understanding that need and maintaining relationships if at all possible and certainly the what we what we know really works is the meeting between prospective adopters and parents or sometimes older siblings other family members maybe grandmothers who've been very important to the child and that really sets the tone for an understanding a feeling of empathy uh, between both birth family and prospective adoptive family and then lastly adoption support which is the orange one and it really provides that message that adoption support is the norm it's not the exception and it really sets out to look towards the child's needs not just in the short term but in the long term as well in terms of identifying that this child may need some help and that provides adoptive parents with with the information and also with the support that they may need at various times during the child's life. Looking at contact in a little bit more detail, the guide works on the basis that keeping in touch is positive and in the child's best interests. And obviously, with some families, it's not possible for that contact to take place. But what we're looking at is really some entrenched thinking, those barriers. Um, and we know all too well that we're still looking towards contact plans at the end of a set of care proceedings being twice a year indirect, what we used to call letterbox contact, um, and not really thinking about the child's needs throughout their life for keeping in touch with family members. So there's some risk averse practice. We have to think about the anxiety of adopters, but uh, that is something that within preparation groups and within assessments and within support, it, a lot of work is being undertaken with prospective adopters to, to really help them understand that keeping in touch with birth family is in their best interests. Lack of support for birth family. How do we expect our birth parents to be able to write a letter saying how they are, how they are doing? Uh, the most difficult thing for them to do, even if there aren't any um, particular issues, how can we expect somebody to be able to do that without support? Sometimes it seems like it's too complex to make a decision. So we go back to the default position of, well, just twice a year and the other priorities take focus. Looking at the possible solutions, it's about building awareness of the positive nature of keeping in touch. If that's in the child's best interest, it's about building perspective taking and confidence. It's about individual risk assessments. And there has just been published by the National Adoption Service uh, an all Wales contact assessment tool. And this assessment tool is to help the child care social worker think about contact in a wider context and what it does is it yes it looks at the risks in terms of of, have, of 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 developing of maintaining contact but it also looks at the benefits and sometimes what we need to do and what the U uea research tells us that sometimes there's more of a risk entailed in not having contact than in having contact particularly uh, what we know from what happens with young people um, coming to the adoption support teams in adolescence when that openness has not been uh, happening with, with parents and, and, and when that keeping in touch hasn't met their particular needs. So it's about that risk assessment, it's about being creative, thinking about using all sorts of a remote contact that we know worked during lockdown and, 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 and giving the thought to, to keeping in touch uh, greater priority. So this is what the contact planning tool says and it is based on the five-step model developed by Beth Neal and, and Polly Baines at, at, uh, at the University of East Anglia and it, it follows these five steps. First of all consider what the purpose of contact is for the child. Step two, identify the strengths and risks for each person involved. So looking at each individual birth family member uh, and the, the, the strengths, the benefits of having that contact and, and then the risks. 
devise a provisional contact plan in relation to each person with a significant connection to the child. And that, that then goes into a provisional support plan for all those involved to help ensure that the contact is meaningful and can be sustained. Because, of course, this contact cannot take place, at least to begin with, without the support of the adoption agency. Uh, and, and so it has to be seen as part of the adoption support plan. And then lastly, it needs to be reviewed. Uh, what changes are needed um, um, in response to a request from one of, of those involved? And as, of course, as time goes on, children's needs change and we need to be able to respond to their needs in terms of that, in terms of that keeping in touch. And that's why it's important, I think, that we keep contact on an informal basis, holding adoptive parents to what they have agreed to at the time of the making of the adoption order but certainly see the making of section 51a contact orders as quite problematic in terms of setting those arrangements in stone um, in anything but very exceptional circumstances early timely support to be able to keep those doors open between adoptive family and birth family are so important. And as I say, what we find is that those meetings, those face-to-face -face meetings between birth family members and prospective adopters are so important in being able to provide that understanding of each other, that just having met face-to-face, -face, knowing who you're writing to, knowing who you're going to maybe meet up with. If that can't happen at an early stage, and what we're asking uh, is, is a lot of our birth parents to be able to meet with prospective uh, uh, adopters um, at, at a time when they may well have just been in court uh, seeking, to, seeking leave to revoke the placement order. They're still wanting to work towards reunification. It's very hard to be able to expect them to turn around and be able to meet with parents, although it does happen and sometimes it does affect uh, birth parents' attitude towards a, a subsequent application for an adoption order. If it can't happen at that early stage, keeping those doors open towards maybe having it having that meeting at a later date when the child's may be older, where maybe birth parents have, have moved on and are able to accept that adoptive family more easily. Those changing needs over time in terms of the child, obviously their needs in terms of contact are going to be different when they're in preschool, when they're in that middle childhood, when they're in adolescence. And it's about being able to be flexible uh, in meeting those child's needs um, as well as being being creative and being supported by the adoption uh, the adoption regions in that in that contact as I've said all of those plans for contact are an integral part of the adoption support plan and this adoption support good practice guide really gives the message to adoptive families that the expectation is that they will want and need support, that that is not a sign of weakness, it's not a sign of failing, that creating an adoptive family is an incredibly complex way of becoming a family and that support will be needed. The adoption support plan, as I say, talks about current and maybe predicted needs over time, although it's not always possible to predict those needs. It provides a support plan that moves with the child and is reviewed. There are ways in which a keeping in touch and reviews can happen. And certainly within some of our regions, that keeping in touch on a yearly basis is really proving to be very worthwhile and, uh, and, and is working in terms of providing the right support to families uh, in relation to contact and in relation to other adoption support needs. The adoption support plan is ratified by the child's local authority. Um, funding is agreed for targeted or any special provision. One of the real challenges to the adoption support mechanism 
is the fact that after three years, uh, the adoption support duty moves from the placing authority to the child's resident authority if it's different. And that's where the adoption service support uh, advisor who has a function under the adoption support regulations uh, has to uh, come to the fore and to liaise with the uh, ASA in there uh, in, in the other authority. There is provision for services for distance placements um, and the strong message to keep in touch. And what you're doing in, in, in seeking that help and obtaining that help is, is really helping your adoptive child, adopted children, to be able to develop that strong dual identity and security in the knowledge of their adoptive family. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this module. As I say, these five good practice guides and the one that I haven't mentioned is the blue one, which looks at the trauma nurture timeline and understanding the child day, goes through the whole process for that, which is a part of the transitions good practice guide. They're all available on the NAS website. If there's any information that you require in terms of the Welsh Early Permanence Framework, please do get in touch with us at AFCA Cymru and um, we're very happy to provide general information uh, on any of these guides.